Good morning, uh, everyone. Great to see you all here. My name is Fadi Gandur. I am the chairman of WAMDA Group. We do venture investing across the Arab world. We have a fantastic panel and incredible panelists today to discuss, to discuss venture. What is venture doing in fueling the growth of the startup ecosystems across the world and specifically maybe in emerging markets? Uh, let me introduce uh, the incredible panelists this morning. His Highness Prince uh, Khalid bin Al-Walid bin Talal Al Saud, founder and CEO of K KBW Ventures. Uh, my friend Hani Inaya, Chief Investment Officer of Sanabil Investments. Christine Tsai, CEO, founding partner of 500 Global. Uh, Dr. Klaus Hommels, founder and CEO of Lakestar. Mr. Saleh Rumeh, who has just become a Saudi citizen last uh, month. Uh, uh, his Thank you. So Saleh has, has deep origins in Saudi Arabia and now he's been uh, 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 granted the Saudi citizenship. So welcome, uh, Saleh, he's managing partner and head of operations of Europe, Middle East and Africa for the Vision, uh, for the Vision Fund. And last but not least, we have GV Shankar, uh, uh, Ravi Shankar, uh, managing partner uh, at Sequoia who uh, covers India mostly, but he's also been exposed and has been living uh, in the region out of Dubai uh, for the past uh, year, year and a half. So welcome everyone. Uh, the, the, we want to address uh, the challenges uh, that we're facing today, the venture funding uh, that is facing today, and maybe question some uh, of the issues that uh, venture has created uh, in the ecosystem uh, of uh, technology across the region. So I'm going to start with you, Your, uh, Your Highness. So is it time uh, for us to revisit how venture invests? Uh, is venture really uh, the, the, the way venture capital, the way it's structured, 10 plus 2, uh, et cetera, is the way to, to fuel uh, the growth for an industry that re requires long term? Sure. Oh, Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for the kind yes. introduction. Uh, obviously, I look up to Fadi very much, so uh, this is a real honor being at the stage with everyone, obviously, here. Um, venture is absolutely not, uh, not going anywhere. Venture is the um, stepping stone of, all, um, uh, of everything innovation. Anything that comes out of venture really grows into um, all the next stages of, um, of a company's cycle of raising. Um, so um, we've actually seen a number of uh, increased amounts of um, innovation happening in the past years, and that's only going to follow in the next uh, years to come. As a matter of fact, there's more dry powder or more um, capital uh, on the sidelines from vintage funds um, than ever before seen, and I think now is the time. Now, in the next few months, is the time to actually really capitalize, save up a lot of capital to really invest in uh, this next economic downturn that we're having. Um, and the best time to invest really is after an economic downturn. So any, venture is definitely not down and out. And, and are, are you feeling uh, the changes that venture is uh, creating in, this, in, in our own region? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for venture, you wouldn't have anything uh, like Web3 of Metaverse, uh, crypto, blockchain, and all the other technologies that are here to stay. Uh, venture, again, is the, is, the, uh, is the foundation of everything that's going to evolve from there when it comes to growth capital, when it comes to going IPO, and the, and the natural rounds of, of investing. So honestly, for me, uh, there's more uh, money being uh, invested in venture. What we've seen now numerous studies, but there's more money uh, being invested in venture in the first three quarters of this year than entire last year. Yes. So the uh, venture is definitely still there. And I'll take that uh, to you, Hani. And you know, you deploy globally. You do, you deploy also in the region. Uh, you're you're uh, you're an enabler of the ecosystem in in the region, specifically in in the kingdom. Uh, what are you seeing now? I mean, the, the, the global uh, markets in general ha have been have been in turmoil. Uh, is are, are we feeling this here? Are you what what? What are we expecting to happen in our own markets? Is it going to come here? Because I don't feel it yet in this market. Well, thank you, Fadi, and great to be here with you and uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, so yeah, you see overall like negative sentiments, but let's take a look back. 
I mean, overall, like if you look at the years that followed the global financial crisis, uh, it produced one of the best vintages in, v in the VC market. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think what's happening in these markets today is a very healthy recalibration. Uh, and if you look at the data, like the first two quarters of this year, like funds fundraised similar amount almost to what they raised like a year ago, but something very interesting is happening. So the dollar amount is healthy, but actually much fewer funds raise that money. So there is much more consolidation happening. Lots of dollars raised, fewer funds are raising. So LPs are basically favoring those very established fund managers with very proven strategies across market cycles and with deep LP connections. Uh, but something interesting that's happening, if you look at the dry powder that these VC funds have, it's actually at an all-time high for this year. But what's interesting, the deal activity has plummeted this year. Uh, so there is lots of dry powder, no investments in the early and like much less investment in the early and late stage, uh, which can make next year very interesting, hoping no more negative news come, which is something that the market did not price yet. Uh, and our our valuations getting to a place where uh, one should jump into this now? I mean, is, is the, the, are early stage and a bit later stage companies uh, and founders uh, realizing that it is no longer la la land of the past five years? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, so everything eventually follow public markets, and th there was lots of public market volatility. However, like private valuations always lag. So if you look at Q1 this year, it was la la land. Nothing was happening, like the valuation was still high. Uh, however, you see the effects starting in Q2 and this quarter as well. Uh, and we expect also major recalibration happening in the next few quarters as well. Fantastic. Uh, Christine, you are committing big time to the kingdom here. Uh, you're doing, uh, I know, I mean, you have, you're, you're exposed globally, obviously, but uh, I, I want to focus a bit on the commitment that you have for the kingdom. What are you seeing in Saudi Arabia? Uh, uh, what is, is it uh, at a stage where you must have, where you experienced in, in your more developed markets in terms of the number of startups, the areas, uh, the founders, the quality of the founders, uh, tell us, why, why you, are you committing to this specific market here? Um, well, definitely. Well, it's, it's good to be on this, in this panel with, um, with my fellow panelists. Uh, 500 has been investing globally since the beginning. We've been investing for 12 years. And specifically for the MENA region, our first investment into the region was 2012. So we have been investing in the region for quite some time. But what we have seen is a very significant shift in terms of the center of gravity. Our first investment into a Saudi company was 2016. And uh, over the years, we have been investing further into the kingdom. Our regional headquarters is now here in Riyadh. Um, our team is based here, and while we do continue to invest throughout the region, we see so much potential with Saudi. We've worked quite closely with uh, partners like, uh, like Sanabil, and it has been really instrumental in developing the startup ecosystem here. And in terms of the potential, we to date have invested in over 60 Saudi companies, and we only see that growing further, especially because of the, the deal flow that we see at the early stages. There's been tremendous, uh, obviously, su tremendous support from the kingdom itself to, to spur entrepreneurship at all levels. And what we have seen both here as well as our work in emerging markets and mature markets around the world is that to build a very sustainable venture ecosystem, it takes multiple parties. It's not just at the, the early stage founder side, but it's also support from the, the public sector, uh, from corporates, and that, that cycle needs to happen over the course of many years in order for it to be truly thriving. Certainly Silicon Valley has had that benefit for you know, 50, 60 years, such that you have those cycles. Companies that grow, raise capital, exit, the, the liquidity happens, comes back into the market, more founders, more founders go off to start companies. So, you know, in terms of um, our global approach, we see our efforts here in, in the kingdom, but you know, broadly in, in the MENA region, only increasing. And we hope to see um, you know, more and more unicorns, although that's, of course, not the most important thing, but, you know, we do see big outcomes happening here. 
maybe you can add a couple of points on, on the enabling environment in the region here so that we're, uh, we're making it a bit relevant to where we are. Uh, what are you seeing? I mean, what, how, how do you feel about the enabling environment? I know there's a lot of capital, but what are uh, other issues that we, you think we should be addressing in, in emerging markets in general, but also in, in, in this very you know, rising region? I think broadly with um, em emerging markets um, as a whole, and, and certainly this applies here, but in, in, in many markets where the startup uh, landscape is, um, it's, is continuing to mature, is that there, there certainly is, capital is still certainly important. I mean, there's, there's capital that goes into the, the, the later stage companies, like at the you know, public side or, or pre-IPO side. And then here, I think there certainly is um, a, a number of, at the angel, pre-seed, seed stage, many seed funds cropping up. So there is starting to be an increase in that early stage capital. Typically in nascent markets, that's the hardest thing for founders. They just, they can't get that first round. Many have, they're forced to bootstrap. Um, so that's a nice development. Um, but all along the, all along the growth of the founder, um, as you get towards, you know, series A, series B, series C, um, in, in many markets, that, that actually still is a gap in terms of companies raising that next round. And unfortunately, when you get to that point past seed, say Series A, Series B, you're, you're large enough that you, you, do, you will raise a larger round. Series A's and Series B's are getting larger, but um, from the, the global capital perspective, there aren't that many global investors that will invest at that stage. It's still early. So these founders are still looking for local capital, and that can be a gap. Um, and in, in terms of other things that we see where there, there's still work to be done is certainly on the, the mentorship, founder, education side. Um, you know, I, I, I'm based in Silicon Valley, although our team is global, and it's a as you can see, you can walk into any coffee shop and there's founders and investors talking and it's, it's much more accessible. Yeah. And over the 10 years, there is a lot more that is accessible in terms of resources online through technology, but um, you know, it's not the same as founders who have been and won in that market. So there is still work to be done in terms of uh, the, uh, the mentorship and resources. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klaus. So uh, I'll pick up where Christine uh, ended there and talk a bit uh, about how you see also challenges. And you invest, you're, you're based in, in Europe, you invest mostly in, in European companies and probably have exposure globally. But what do you think are the challenges, the challenges that worry global investors when you look at the emerging markets where we think, uh, you know, the next big opportunities are? Why are we not seeing uh, we only, well, we do see, see some, but trickles. But there is still a big worry. Is it because, you know, you want to make the, the highest returns possible in, emer in emerged and already developed markets, and you worry about our fragmentation and uh, the other political challenges that are in the region? I mean, what, what are the issues that global funds uh, uh, have uh, when looking at our own, uh, our markets here and emerging markets in general? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, um, Europe is um, a little bit complex in terms of pushing decisions through. It has been set up to avoid <coughs> war, which has worked very long, so uh, that comes at a cost of being more progressive in pushing things. But um, <clears throat> now I think it has developed hugely the last, last years, and I'm amazed how forward-looking and advanced you are here. You have already discovered, and, and you're very much pushing, that venture is the <clears throat> decisive assets class for the next years to come. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> so when you look at it in, in, in terms of um, the necessity, it, the narrative for Europe is a little bit the, the complexity. So I did a study with McKinsey uh, where we analyzed why Europe has become rich. And basically, Europe is very famous for its middle stand, for its family businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have been financed, Europe has financed innovation with 4% of the GDP. In earlier times, this innovation was called Bosch, Siemens, BMW, Mercedes, and banks financed this innovation. Now banks in Europe have a stronger regulatory framework and are not in a position anymore to finance innovation. So this is beautiful for venture funds. Yeah, because if you think about the, the renovation, rejuvenation rate of the industry is something like 3-4%. 
So uh, the, at a DAX, that is 100 billion a year. Uh, and if you see Europe, it is three, four hundred billion a year. This had been financed by banks, and this will be financed structurally by venture and growth funds in the next years. So the, uh, if you ask me like problems, um, so the revelation and the clear vision on the political side to do that, that is what is missing in Europe. So, for example, regulation on insurance, regulation on pension funds prohibits the money to come in. Endowments we do not have to that extent as we have them in the US. So the core sources of money going into the funds is, 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 is in a different way. So states have to do the jumpstart uh, jump financing. And then we are very happy that um, the interest from different regions in the, in the world is also clearly accelerating because the ecosystem has now um, uh, had the, reached a maturity which is perfect. So you see that with the Sequoias and others opening office in Europe, that is a clear testament to the attractiveness of the market. Thank you for that. Uh, Saleh, you've, we were talking right before we came in that you've, the Vision Fund has deployed $120 billion give or take 10 120 billion dollars in 5 years yes Le a bit less than 5 years so uh, and so you you get exposure globally uh, and you you've seen you were part of the absolute booms and and a bit of of what i can call maybe the bust now i mean I, what are the lessons learned here what what have we learned from what what you were doing and what we're seeing now Sure. Well, first of all, um, I'd just like to reiterate that I'm very proud to be a Saudi citizen. I was granted citizenship this year, so to all my Saudi <laughs> brothers and sisters, it's an honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of lessons, well, just to put some context, uh, as you said, uh, Fadi, we invested over $130 billion in 450 companies. So we have a lot to draw lessons from. First lesson, I think, is that Innovation comes from many different parts of the world today, right? It used to be the Valley, Berlin, London, but today innovation comes from all over the place. What, what I call the capillaries of the world. India, for example, is a huge area. Here in the kingdom itself, we have some investments in common with Hani, and we've, I've met some incredible founders. So. I, I, the good news is that innovation is coming from all the pockets in the world, and I think it's important for all of us as investors to be present in these capillaries to pick up on the innovations. That's one. I think the, the, the other lesson we've learned is that, uh, and you mentioned emerging markets, and although I don't associate the kingdom as an emerging market per se, I think we all coexisted for many years in a system of globalization where there was interdependence between different regions. <coughs> that today, I think, is going to get challenged given where geopolitics is headed. Um, and I think the role of different countries is going to have to get redefined because some of this interdependence is going to dissipate, right? So what does that mean for a lot of our tech companies and a lot of these early stage companies? it's going to be, I think, harder for them to cross borders. In fact, when you look at our portfolio companies, one thing we've noticed is that going cross-border, becoming international is a much more difficult task. A technology may be adopted by the US or Europe, wherever it is, but it's hard to grow cross-border. I think the other challenge, of course, is as investors, we're obviously very focused on um, returning capital to our investors. For different parts of the world, the question becomes, what's the exit? And one of the biggest challenges today is that the stock markets are now recalibrating, and it's not as accommodative towards companies that have what we call long duration, profits that are backdated. So back in the old days, I think, um, well, not that old, but just recently, it was much simpler for companies to try and target NASDAQ as the prize to exit that's becoming much more challenged. But luckily, we have stock markets in India, yeah. here in the kingdom, the Tadawul, that can accommodate these companies. And it's important for investors that we have an eye on exits. 
that's very important as well. And, and so far, we have yet to see that wave of local markets being able to uh, accept and adopt these new companies as they come and provide enough liquidity and enough depth for investors to not just exit, but also new investors to come in and invest. Um, and I think lastly, the, 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 and this is the elephant in the room, we have a new paradigm where money is not free anymore, Fadi. You know, since 2008, we enjoyed zero interest rates for very long. I mean, effectively, that means capital was free. Capital was abundant. And I think many investors lost a bit of discipline in, 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 in terms of deploying that capital. And the companies themselves didn't have to work that hard. If capital is free, equity doesn't have to work that hard. Right? Today, the risk-free rate is, depending on what you consider the risk-free rate to be, it's around 4%, probably headed to 5 maybe even higher. All risk assets, as a result, is getting repriced. So venture capital, venture equity is going to get repriced as well. And I think that's something we need to be mindful of. And I think in the past, people lost sight of the fact that there was a required return that you had to adjust depending on which part of the world you were investing in, what stage of the company you're investing in. Great. I, I have a couple of follow-ons, but I want to go to GV. A uh, couple of questions. You're Sequoia. Uh, you're do it, focusing on India uh, and other emerging markets now. Uh, last year, so there is that emerging market element, but you're also the global, you know, very famous venture fund. But last year, you came out with a big statement on Sequoia transforming into, per, into permanent capital. What does that mean? What does that mean to startups? What does that mean to investors? What does that mean to, to you, to the venture industry in general? I think you know, there's, there's a lot of lessons there about patient capital. Absolutely. First, uh, pleasure to be here along with uh, my fellow panelists here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to start with the story of the pre-story to this is maybe 2014 or 15 when we all met at a global offsite. Uh, we did this exercise called the pre-mortem. Uh, pre-mortem is really like a post-mortem, but done much ahead, right? And the statement was, Sequoia's dead, it's 2030, Sequoia's dead. What went wrong, right? And, you know, that really kind of made all of us look up and say, what, Sequoia's dead? We just completed 50 years, by the way. But at that time, the question really was, if Sequoia becomes irrelevant, why did we become irrelevant? And that really pointed us to a couple of uh, things that came out of that session. One is the fact that companies, the way they were invested in and how they exited, et cetera, over a period of time dramatically changed. You know, if you were in the late 90s, uh, you know, you start a company in two or three years, you're a public company, right? And even before some significant maturity has occurred, when you're high growth, you go public. But what's happened in the last 10, 15 years is companies are just staying private longer because there's just so much more value accretion that's happening in the private markets. So you need longer term, more patient capital. So venture can't think like, hey, I've got 10 years and I've got to get in and get out within that time period because significant portion of the value accretion happens later. And founders are expecting you to be with their journeys because you are the first capital in or the first you know, couple of capital <coughs> providers in. You understand the company best and they expect you to stay with them longer. Right? So that's one. Second, I think this notion of you know, capital being the differentiator is gone. This capital is not anymore a differentiator. Capital is now available from various different types of vehicles, whether it's family offices, seed funds, you know, others. And so founders are actually asking the question, saying, how are you going to add value to my journey through the company? And so company building has become a very significant portion of how you need to think about it. So those were two kind of insights, and we started saying, hey, how do we shape Sequoia towards kind of doing both well. And last year, you know, we had the opportunity to kind of go to this permanent structure, which is essentially like saying, look, uh, uh, LPs trust us with their capital. Many times when we have a 10 plus two structure, when we return capital, they actually don't know what to do with it. They're like, hey, you know, uh, if you guys, should I hold this stock when we distribute a stock or should we sell it? Most people end up selling it because they don't really understand the underlying company that well, right? So we felt it was better that for the enduring companies, we hold them for much longer because some of them surprise you on the way uh, upside. And we have the flexibility for people to come in and come out through a public pool. But for us as uh, capital uh, managers, we have much more long-term permanent capital that we can support our companies with, where we can go and tell a founder today, look, we can be there from idea to IPO and beyond, right? And that's a very powerful 
kind of uh, partnership that you can strive with a founder. And so that's the reason we went to a permanent capital structure. And we think this is the question on VCs being relevant for the long term. I think we have to adapt ourselves to be relevant to the changes in the market. A quick one. Uh, you're famous to communicate with your founders, the companies that you've invested in. What, what, did, what are you telling your founders today? Quickly. Yeah. Yeah. What are you telling them? Absolutely. So we started telling them uh, maybe uh, uh, September, October of last year saying, look, cut your burn, conserve capital, uh, make sure you don't have to be in the market for 24 months. Do they have the skill set to do that? Because in the past 12 years, I say some entrepreneurs, people do, and some people are entrepreneurs learning the hard were told, don't, don't care about what you do with your cash, just spend, 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 and their skill set is spending. Do they know how to actually do something else? Father, great question. Some of them do, but most of them don't, and they have to learn the hard way, unfortunately. It, it's hard for founders to suddenly switch from growth mode. Yeah, but we've, cut, we've and it's spoiled baby, them. typically, right? So it's very hard for them to start. Yeah, yeah. And we have to switch. take some responsibility for that. Too. And, and I think that's Absolutely. the road of the board. I think that's the road of the board. And so I'll take that to you also, Your, your Highness, on, on have we spoiled the founders? <laughs> have we... Uh, spoiled them in a way where they've, they've focused on one area and then suddenly they discovered that the world is much more complex than, 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 than uh, triple-digit growth? <laughs> I think the model of growth at any cost uh, has definitely been broken, and I think we're thankful for that. I think the road to profitability is the, is the way to go. Um, uh, with governments printing money during COVID did not help um, the road to profitability. However, it fueled the growth at any, uh, at any uh, cost uh, model. Uh, however, I do see a lot of VCs pulling back from that model, a lot of uh, VCs giving a lot of advice to uh, founders to start conserving um, their, um, um, uh, their capital. And I think this is a good thing. Uh, we have to focus... Right now, uh, we should have done that before, but regardless of that, interest rates are zero. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity and there's a lot of possibility for, uh, for founders to raise money anywhere uh, in the market, uh, whether it was a good company or whether it was just an idea uh, just out of thin air. Um, so from my point of view, honestly, I do think that the slowdown is a good thing, and I think there's a lot of money being put in the sidelines uh, for the next, let's say, 8, 12 to 16 months, or 18 months rather. Uh, and I think we're going to see a good amount of quality capital going to, going to deploy in quality companies uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. Yeah. Hani, uh, I'll take the same question to yes. you. But I'll also add, I want you to add a little bit and say, do investors, venture investors, have also to build a different skill set in, uh, since the past 10 years in how we actually help our startups? So, because yes. if they don't know, then, then that skill set needs to be built somewhere else also to agree bridge them. I agree 100%. And I think in this market, we will learn like the difference between experienced investors and non-experienced investors. Because growth will always be the core of VC investment. However, like it's different modes of growth. Uh, as Khaled mentioned, Danny, in an era of like near zero interest rate and uh, ample liquidity, it might make sense to fuel growth by subsidizing the customer, basically. Uh, like, because, I mean, v the VC asset class is not isolated from the overall market, and the market goes through cycles of boom and bust. So when there is a boom cycle, a seasoned founder or a seasoned investor will understand that, yes, growth at all costs can make sense. However, when we enter the boom cycle or the bust cycle, uh, things have to, have to change. And I think boards have to take ample responsibility in these markets. For our portfolio companies, uh, we are emphasizing with lots of them, you can't grow at all costs right now. You have to basically emphasize sustainability. Uh, and you need to be or extend your runway. For example, if someone is having a runway of six months now, they're almost in a bad shape in my opinion. You have to optimize for extending runways to like 18 months or more because so many like bullish investments happened in the last six months or the last 18 months in the region. And no one knows whether this momentum will continue or not. So many things are not yet factored in the market, whether there will be a US recession next year or not. Uh, so it's really a wait and see, and no one wants to catch a fall or a knife falling, basically. So I think boards have to take lots of responsibilities and monitor things very closely because Absolutely. of the lack of Absolutely. certainty. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'd chime in here. So 
I think uh, that's where also you will have like very two different kind of VCs. The ones being founded after 2010 and 2011 that have only been momentous investors so far, and those that are there before. So and those that were there before, they had it basically twice with the meltdown in 2001 and then with the, seven, the 2007, 2008. And I think if you cool down and um, have a long-term view, that is the right attitude to founders. You mustn't forget these, these are the stars. So they have a one-trick pony. They uh, put their CV for seven, eight, ten years on one number, yeah, so to say. And if you guide them, with a, with a real sort of being relaxed and having a midterm view and taking sober decisions of the, of the momentum moods, I think that is something that is now demanded for the, um, for the, the top uh, founders. Right. Uh, Christine, is, is this a, 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 the dot com crash? A similar moment as the new companies that have, had emerged uh, from that dot-com crash back in, in 2000, are we experiencing something similar today where the new companies that are going to create the next wave of the digital uh, landscape are emerging now? Is this, uh, does, does this, is this a blessing in disguise that we are having this, this disruption in the market? I think there is, I mean, when you look at the different crises over the, you know, the past 20 years, certainly the dot-com bust, uh, GFC, and, and, and what we're going through now, um, there are parallels, of course, but I think what we're going through is not going to be anything like the, the last two crises, simply because it's, uh, there's different drivers for what is going on. So I think there's, that's what is creating a lot of this uh, fear and uncertainty, because people want to try to connect it to something that has happened. But, you know, I, I, th I do think that it is, uh, it is due for correction. Um, you know, your earlier question, is venture dead? Is this, you know, what does it look like? I mean, certainly I, I don't think so. I don't think any of, of us on the panel believe that. But I do think there is a correction just because we've had an incredible bull run over the past 15 years. There's been a lot of capital into the market. Um, and in terms of the, the growth at all costs or sustainable growth, I think, I, I don't believe that it's going to swing completely the other way for that long where investors only care about profitability. At some point, you know, they, that's what the big focus is right now because there has been very reckless growth, companies with very poor unit economics that are just burning cash and really just don't, ultimately don't have product market fit. Um, and they're really looking at these uh, top line numbers, very misleading. Um, so I think what's really critical is to understand that um, venture still looks for growth. I mean, we're looking for the big outcomes and you can't do that by just um, kind of very, very, very slow growth. And, but what we want is sustainable growth, and sometimes it's hard to find that balance. But you know, even in our portfolio, we do have examples of companies that are profitable, you know, have very strong cash uh, on the balance sheet, but they, they are growing. Um, so those businesses are out there. But I think our role as investors is, um, is to help our companies um, operate prudently. And I think there hasn't been a lot of that for, for the last year. The people right. have been quite greedy. Um, so I do think that in terms of do we expect the next game-changing iconic companies to come out of this crisis, I think if, if history tells us anything, we're going to have a very good vintage um, the, this year, next couple of years, because there will be some very amazing companies coming out, and they will be coming from all over, not just Silicon Valley. Last question. We don't have, we have practically a minute. Are LPs, are LPs, uh, knowledgeable enough to understand that it is time to invest now because the market is this is the time to invest or are they worried because of the disruption that uh, you what are you seeing I, I i think we're headed towards a very good part of the cycle right um there's no doubt but i think things have to settle down first we have to see where interest rates settle down right there's not consensus as to what that's gonna jv yeah i think uh, right now there's a dislocation because the public positions are down, so the private exposure has actually increased, so there is a concern. But that said, for markets, India particularly, and maybe even Middle East, I do think these markets fundamentally are still seeing growth, so there is a lot of interest uh, even today. Fantastic. Well, th this would, could take us days to discuss. Thank you so much. Incredible panel. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.